since I've lived here, I haven't seen the district attorney be accountable to anybody. And I want to know why that's happening because I vote just like everybody else. It's because we're not holding them accountable. So the district attorney has not been held accountable to anybody. And we actually have a section on accountability and uh, holding that office, particularly the FDA, accountable later on. But no, that is a great question. And um, everybody should highlight that because that is a serious issue uh, that actually was a catalyst into the development of the Denver Justice Project. Next slide, please. So this is just an overview of the structure of the district attorney's office. The head DA currently, Mitch Morrissey, this is the highest paid state elected official. Uh, underneath him, he has two chief deputy DAs, Chief Deputy Lamar Sims and Chief Deputy uh, Doug Jackson. It's important to highlight Lamar Sims for, for this reason in particular. One, you have to understand the history of Denver. Denver has got a long legacy of allowing law enforcement to do whatever they want without seeking serious repercussions, AKA felony crimes. Uh, or felony charges for felony crimes, murder, assault, etc. Um, but one thing Lamar Sims did was he was appointed as an independent, an alleged independent prosecutorial body to go out and oversee the Tamir Rice case. Tamir, Tamir Rice case, an 11 year old, or, no, 12, 12 year old, Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, within seconds, three seconds, this officer drives up onto the grass, opens fire, and kills the young man. And Doug Jackson, or Lamar Sims was the district attorney who was appointed as an independent body to review the case and to no surprise, he found that the officer acted within policy and justified the shooting. Uh, immediately we reached out to the attorney, uh, a lot, letting them know that this is a pattern that we've seen throughout Denver's history, um, not only under Lamar Sims, but Mitch Morrissey as well. Um, and then the rest of the attorneys and the officer deputy attorneys. So these are the three individual stages of attorneys that you'll find uh, and then there's office admin who are uh, in there helping with day-to-day -day functions as well. So I, I understand that the NBA is going to be elected. Are these other officials elected as well? They're appointed by the NBA. So that also means that they can be done away with upon new election. We can, or like just rolled over, right? Yes, yes, yeah. that's true. Sure. Sure. And also, something else to note, Chief Deputy Doug Jackson, uh, in the case of Anthony Waller, Anthony Waller is an inmate in the Denver City Jail who was assaulted by a deputy in front of a judge, spun around and smashed into a metal door frame, caused serious damage to his face. Uh, the judge was the person who reported the uh, abuse to Internal Affairs, and Chief Deputy Judge Doug Jackson was actually found at a later date by a federal judge to be negligent in the way he handled the case. So these are our two, these are our, our Chief Deputy Mitch Morrissey and then these are our two Chief Deputies uh, underneath him. So just to give you a little background as to the hierarchy of the office. Next slide, please. Um, so, so this, just real quick, this is just, um, again, these are units inside the office. We put this up here to highlight how, how many intersections this office has and in our day-to-day -day work, uh, this office impact, impacts us and how we're impacted. Um, so you can't really approach a district attorney without a lens of intersectionality, anywhere from juvenile diversion to uh, intake division, appellate division, uh, family unit, economic crime unit, uh, et cetera. So when you think about the DA's office, think about uh, a diversity uh, of lenses and effects, so. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. Cool, this is just a quick map just to orient us. So this is the state of Colorado. It is split up into 22 judicial districts and we're in the second. And it's right here and very tiny. But we also incarcerate the most people out of the whole state, clearly. Um, next slide, please. I only wanted to just give you a little bit of uh, grounding of the map because uh, just to give a quick overview of this uh, portion of the office, the Vail Board or the Victims Assistant and Law Enforcement Board, which is the, um, it was basically a bill approved by the Colorado Legislature years back that was um, going to funnel money from uh, basically restitution, so when people pay, uh, pay the court, pay their court fees, pay any charges, um, that goes into a pot of money and is then distributed out to either community uh, victim-serving organizations, but the majority, again, of that money is going 
directly back into the budgets of the police department and the sheriff's department. Um, really quickly, this last part on the end of the slide says we want to resist the, this term victims of crime because Oftentimes, the types of violence that's happening in our community or that our community members are facing is actually legal. And so it's never gonna be a crime. And it's not to say that we want more things to be de uh, defined as a crime, but we're just talking about the fact that a lot of these things are actually legal. Next slide, please. Um, so, as Alex already touched on, uh, this, this slide was just meant to highlight again the fact that this office also is, a, is allowed to lobby on our behalf. They're supposed to, again, be an advocate for the people, seek justice, um, but the uh, district, the Colorado District Attorney's Council is a lobbying body uh, that the, the district attorneys um, get together and basically try to influence the legislature to uh, pass legislation. And a lot of that legislation often turns into, uh, is, is sort of biased toward things that are tough on crime. This kind of ideology has been around since the 80s of um, how we're going to address problems in our community, uh, it's just be really harsh on criminals. And again, these tough on crime bills that are often advocated for by the district attorneys um, and, and their lobbying functions are things that promote and increase mass incarceration uh, create more criminal, more crime, so that there can be more criminals to feed this for-profit system. Um, and it's just really important for us to understand that when we elect a district attorney, we are also electing someone who will go and, and, and lobby at the Capitol. Um, so again, just more of the necessity of us to know who these people are and hold them accountable for, for their actions. Uh, next slide. Um, so this is a moment where we want to just pause. Um, so we told you a little, this is a, just a kind of overview of uh, what the district attorney does, what they're empowered to do, um, and, and how their, their office works. So we want you to just uh, turn to your neighbor, and, or two or three neighbors, um, and talk for just a minute about where you can see the impact of the district attorney. Um, have you seen uh, charges going a certain way? Have you seen uh, the lobbying? Have you seen any of these things? Go ahead and uh, just take uh, two minutes, one minute each, to turn and talk to your neighbors about where you see the impacts of the district attorney's office. So and if you don't know your neighbor, introduce yourself and get to know your neighbor. Please. We are at my neighbor here. Hi. Uh, I'm If the other person has a talk, go ahead and let them talk. And before we move on, we just want to see if there's one or two people who want to share something interesting that you heard from your neighbor. Uh, 
Does anyone have something that stuck out to them and that they want to uh, just tell us about ways that you've seen the impact of the district attorney? Um, I was going to say, um, her name is Liberty, the lady that I just met, and she was talking about she's been to meetings that, what's his name, Mitch Morrissey has been to and stuff like that, and she said she doesn't see where he's actually taking any recognition of the community. And what I was telling her is I'm not originally from here. I'm from Oklahoma. And um, since I've been here, the impacts that I've seen on the community that I live in has been nothing but negative. You know, it hasn't been positive. He, I haven't seen anybody really try and hold him accountable and he functions as if he's untouchable. And uh, that's not a good space to be in. Thank you. And actually, we are going to touch on accountability. Let's get, let's get just one more over here. Yes. Um, with that being said, um, him feeling like he's untouchable, at the first, uh, the film that they had downtown on uh, after the parade, uh -huh. one of the things that they were talking about is how they had read the, the new. Um, the new Jim Crow? The new Jim Crow. And I read that years ago, but then I, about a year ago, then I went back and I started listening in on CD. And one of my concerns is, I'm wondering how much of that did Mitch Morrissey actually read? Because it looks like what he's doing is, he's taking it back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that worries me about the other DAs as well. Right, absolutely. I mean. We can go ahead and say, we're not fans of Mitch Morrissey at all. Um, and sometimes it seems like he read the new Jim Crow as an instruction manual instead of as a warning. Um, and yeah, there's a lot of a lot of issues. And there's definitely here in Denver, we're not at all absolved from this, this kind of process. So thank you for that. I hope uh, that you learned something about uh, you folks' experiences in your uh, community. But let's go ahead and move on. Next slide. So also, just to highlight, those were also community voices, um, both two separate opinions around the current district attorney and his practices. So what happens after an incident of police violence? Um, we don't want to spend too much time on this because, and obviously this is a charged topic and a very important topic in our communities, uh, not just across the country, but across the globe. Um, but here in Denver, so the DA, an incident happens, the DA decides to prosecute, or, or the DA decides to indict or to not indict. And that has absolutely nothing to do with the discipline matrix, and that has nothing to do with the independent monitor's office, or whether or not there is a possibility of a civil settlement taking place. Uh, the district attorney is investigating criminal cr or crimes, criminal activity that may have taken place. The discipline, discipline matrix, which is, uh, has several major components, beginning in internal affairs underneath uh, Stephanie O'Malley as the, as the executive director of safety. She oversees uh, all law enforcement here in the city. And they're reviewing for policy violations, internal uh, infractions that happen uh, outside of the policing manual or the manual for law enforcement. And the independent monitor, uh, that office was created out of, after the murder of Paul Childs, 11-year-old, um, who was shot and killed by police in 2003, I believe, maybe 2005. But that office was developed uh, in response to that as an independent agency uh, responsible for reviewing cases of excessive force or misconduct by law enforcement that is supposed to be independent.